All right. As I mentioned during the announcements, I'm gonna this morning's sermon. I'm gonna be explaining why we do things the way it's really important for for everyone to understand in church. You know, why why do we do the things that we do? And, and this is important for every belief that you have, any any tradition you might follow, anything that you any doctrine that you hold to in the church or you know in the Bible. Um, you know, a bad answer. Well, why, why, why do we do things this way? Is I don't know. It's just the way we've always done them, right? That's, that's a really bad answer to have when it comes to serving God and, and the things that we do and how we should reckon, you know, all, all of the observations that we have, the way that we worship, everything that we do, we ought to have a good reason, a good explanation for why we do the things we do. Now, we're an independent, fundamental Baptist church. Independent means that we are not associated literally with any other church. I mean, we have churches that are like-minded. We have churches where I'm friends with the pastors, and we get along really great. But at the end of the day, the way that we do things here is the way that we do things here. Right. And as no, you know, other people might have a different belief on this, and you know what? That's just fine. They can do whatever they're going to do in their church, but the way that we do things here is a certain way, and it's based on my understanding of Scripture and the way that, that I'm going to lead this church, and I'm going to explain that to you this morning. So um, Wednesday, as we've mentioned already, is going to be the day that we are going to honor and, and remember and practice the Lord's Supper, which is also referred to as communion. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Um, communion is not a bad word, okay, just because... Uh, the Catholic Church uses that word, and, and they kind of, they've, they've really um, butchered the, the, the doctrine of the Lord's Supper and communion. doesn't mean we just should stay away from that word. You know, we, we're going to use what the Bible says. Um, but like I said, I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Let's start, we're going to start off here because to get an understanding of, of the Lord's Supper, we're going to see here in Luke chapter 22 that it starts off as a recognition or, um, of the Passover. So when Jesus has his supper with, with his disciples, it is, it is really to celebrate Passover, but it's his transition from the Passover to the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. And, and there are differences between the two. And this is him basically instituting for the New Testament, this is what you're going to do from now on because he is the lamb that is going to be sacrificed the very next day as the Passover lamb so that we no longer are going to be sacrificing animals, you know, lambs in, you know, in observance of the Passover. So we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit of time in the Old Testament. We're going to look at all of the Passover scriptures so that we could understand the timing of this. Because the first thing I want to show you is just why are we doing this on Wednesday? Why, you know, why, why that day? Some churches will have, a, will have a Lord's Supper commemoration every week. Some churches don't necessarily have a schedule. They'll do it multiple times throughout the year. So, you know, there, there's people do it different times. At, at Word of Truth Baptist Church, we do this once a year. And it's always going to fall on the Wednesday prior to Easter. And we're going to see why do we do that. Well, let's, let's go back here and uh, we're going to reread some of these verses in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verse number 8. Jesus Christ is sending Peter and John to find a place for them. He says, And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. So he's definitely preparing to eat the Passover with his disciples. I mean, there's no doubt about that. That's what he's doing. That's his intent. Verse number 9. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you enter in the city... There shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And he shall say unto the good men of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. We cannot deny the linking between him having this, you know, what's called the Lord's Supper with the Passover. I mean, there's, there's, there's a very good reason why he's saying all of this. Now, let's keep going here. For I say unto you, I will, not eat, I will not anymore eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread 
and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me likewise also the cup after supper saying this cup is the new testament in my blood which is shed for you so he's showing them explicitly that now when you're eating this bread when you're drinking this cup this is to commemorate me my body and my blood which is being shed for you and it's exactly what the passover is also it's a it's a picture of the same thing with more clarity so the 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 lamb that is being the the body of the lamb and the blood being shed of the lamb was a picture prior to jesus christ coming showing that there was going to be a savior there's going to be a messiah there is going to be someone that's going to come and be the sacrifice for your sins Amen. so as he comes now he tells them now he's the day before he's going to be sacrificed he's telling okay look my body is going to be sacrificed for you this is my flesh this bread that you're eating now is going to commemorate my flesh this this wine that you're drinking this cup is commemorating my blood which i'm going to shed for you tomorrow and he gives them this um, these instructions he tells them this is what's happening and he wants them to do this in remembrance of me now we're going to get back into this a little bit further we're going to first corinthians 11 near the end of the sermon but i want to cover the timeline um, turn if you would to exodus chapter 12. exodus chapter 12. he references the passover multiple times in first corinthians 5 the Bible says in verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. There's no doubt Jesus Christ came to be the Passover lamb, to be the lamb slain once from the foundation. Or you know, Scripture, it, it, unless you're brand new to church, you've heard this before. This is nothing brand new. This is nothing earth shattering, right? Jesus Christ is the lamb of God. Jesus Christ came to be the Passover lamb for us. But let's look now at some of the, the timeline and the dates and the feasts and the things that were established in the Old Testament here for the Passover. Because this is all very important. It's going to play into um, the sermon this morning. And I want you to pay attention. Look at Exodus chapter 12. We're going to start reading in verse number 2. The Bible says, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year unto you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. This is God giving Moses the instructions of when they come, when they're coming out of Egypt, that is such a big event of God freeing them from bondage, of God, you know, completely eliminating the bondage and freeing them, bringing them out. Um, essentially leading them out into the promised land it's such a big event he's saying this is the beginning of the year for you this is this is you're starting every year now from this from this time from this day because because it's so significant and then he says on the 10th day of this month is when you need to find a lamb you need to take a lamb he says in verse number four and if the household be too little for the for the lamb let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be, look at verse 5, without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now here we're seeing many of the similarities and how, how Christ perfectly fits that Passover lamb. Jesus Christ was a lamb. He was without blemish. He was without spot. He was without sin. Jesus Christ was the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice for our sin. But in, in the, sim, the symbolism here, when they, when they chose out their lamb is, it needs to be a good lamb. You can't get a lame lamb. You can't get the sickly lamb. You need to find a good lamb without blemish, no problems, in order to, to, to be a sacrifice that is acceptable unto the Lord. And he says they're supposed to take it on the 10th day, and they need to hold on to it up until the 14th day. And basically, they're, they're kind of making sure they got a good lamb, there's nothing wrong with this lamb, and they're keeping it separate now and, and you know, separating it from the rest up until the 14th day. 
of the same month. And then it says, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And if you remember uh, the story when Jesus Christ is being tried, and, and it says that basically all the Jews are saying, crucify him, crucify him, right? And, and that lines up again right here with the whole assembly of the congregation killing the lamb in the evening. We see the same thing played out during Jesus Christ's crucifixion. So uh, I don't want to get too far into that either, though, because we're still, I want to stay on the timeline here. It's the 14th day of the month. The lamb is slain at even. That is when, when the lamb is slain. And that is the beginning of the Passover because that night after the lamb was slain is when the blood needed to be put on the doorposts of the children of Israel. Because this is when they were, this is the last plague when the firstborn son was going to die in Egypt when God was delivering them out. They had to kill the lamb. They had to put the blood on the doorposts of their house so that way when the death angel was going through and killing all the firstborn sons, he was going to pass over. He was going to skip the, the children of Israel, anybody that had that blood put on their house. When, they, when, when, when God, when that angel would see the blood, as the song goes, I will pass, I will pass over you. Because, again, the symbolism when we have the blood uh, applied to us, the blood of Jesus Christ applied to us, we're forgiven. God's not going to condemn us. He's not going to hold us guilty. We're not going to be um, you know, cast into hell. Amen. All of our sins are forgiven. So this is that night, that 14th day, they were supposed to put the blood on the doorpost. That's also then the day, that night, when Pharaoh just finally had enough because there's so much death now and he's just like, you guys just get out of here. Get out of here and I don't want to see your face and you know, just, just go. And they had to leave in a rush. They had to leave in a hurry because now they're just being kicked out. Like you, got, you have to get out of here right now. It's not time to gather up your things. So as a result of that, they have to, um, God already prepared them and told them that you're going to be eating unleavened bread. Why? Because unleavened bread, you know, when you add leavened bread, you got, there's time it takes to rise. You got to, you know, there's a lot more involved in the preparation. But when you're leaving in a hurry, you don't got time for all that. He's saying, you're going to need some food for your journey. And, you're, you know, and there's other symbolism with the, with the leaven and everything else. We get into that. But um, you know, the, what actually happened that night, I mean, this is, it, it all fits together so perfectly. The lamb was slain, the blood was applied, they got kicked out, and now they have to just take their, their unleavened bread and go and get out of there. Passover started that 14th day in the evening with the lamb being slain. Now let's keep reading. Let, uh, your next is 12, right? Let's keep going here. Look at verse number 8. It says, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. And this is important, too, because there's so many symbolic references between Christ being a Passover. We don't want to pass over any of this stuff. The way that they had to eat the lamb, it says, roast with fire. And then in verse 9, it goes on to, the Bible goes on to clarify, eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire. He's saying, don't boil it. Don't eat it raw. You must roast it with fire. His head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof, verse number 10, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Now, why is all that important? Because there's a doctrine that seems to be slipping these days in many churches that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, when he was the lamb that sacrificed, he was offered up himself as that sacrifice to pay the penalty for sin that we deserve to pay. When he died up on that cross, he shed his blood as the, the lamb's blood is shed when it's being sacrificed, when it's being offered up as an offering. But it didn't stop there. When Jesus Christ died, they buried his body in a tomb. But the Bible says that his soul went to hell for three days and three nights. And if you want proof of that, you can see that very clearly in the book of Acts. Keep your finger here in Exodus 2. You can turn to Acts chapter number 2. And I show this to people out soul winning often because it's something that some people know and some people have been taught and other people are just like, wow, I've never heard that before. I'll ask people and say, you know, Jesus Christ, yeah, I'm giving them the gospel. I'm explaining what Jesus Christ did, explaining how he died on the cross. I'm going to explain the resurrection. 
But I say, you know, for those three days and three nights that Jesus Christ was dead after he died, his body was in the tomb. Before he rose again from the dead, where was his soul? I mean, his soul had to go somewhere. Half the people, it seems, will say, well, he's in heaven with God, sitting on the right hand of God the Father. And the other half of people will say, I don't know, or, or they'll say he went to hell. And the Bible is very clear in Acts chapter 2, and you could read this whole thing in context later, because it wasn't even in my notes. I wasn't going to get into this that much. But read in context. You've got Peter quoting from the Old Testament, and he's quoting the Psalms. And he says, in verse 27 is the quote, he says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And then in verse 31, he explains that quote. He explains that passage of scripture. He says, he, talking about David, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ. So now he's saying, this is what that verse means. That verse is talking about the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. You can't get much clearer than that. He said, the resurrection of Christ, Jesus Christ's soul was not left in hell. And in order for a soul to be left in hell, guess what? It had to be in hell. That's right. You can't just leave something somewhere where it never was in the first place. His soul was not left in hell. Neither did his flesh see corruption. So when Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, he, and, and it, it only makes sense. I mean, why, why all of this detail Look, it's got to be roast with fire. When you, sacrifice, you know, when you sacrifice this lamb, the Passover lamb, you got to find one without blemish. Yeah, praise God, everyone's going to say, without blemish, of course, because Jesus Christ was perfect. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. Yeah, we have to do that. And then you, you show all these other examples. But then when you get to the part where he says, it's got to be roast with fire. Don't eat it raw. Don't sod it with water. It's got to be raw. And anything that's left over, you burn it with fire. It needs to be burnt. People want to say, oh yeah, but Jesus didn't go to hell. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, it really doesn't. And it fits in perfectly with, you know, and there's plenty of other scriptures we could turn to. Jesus Christ said himself, you know, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Amen. And that's where he was. It's the heart of the earth. This is, these are all pictures of our Lord Jesus Christ. And even just on a logical standpoint, you know, we... we People know that, the, you know, we tell people that, the, hey, the punishment for your sins, if you, if you die in your sins, you're going to hell. That's the punishment, right? I mean, God's the judge. We've broken his law. We deserve a punishment. That punishment is to pay for our sins in hell. Jesus Christ came and died to pay for our sins. Doesn't it only make sense that he paid for our sins in hell? I mean, if that's our punishment and he came to pay the punishment for us, that he actually did pay the, the punishment that we would be expected to pay ourselves? Makes perfect sense. Let's continue on here, though, because I don't want to get too distracted from the timeline. There's so, there's so much. There's, I mean, there's multiple sermons you can preach just in, in all of this. Uh, the Bible's amazing. Um, uh, verse number 11, And thus shall you eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord." Verse number 13, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And it's notice he's even telling us here that the blood is a token. It is symbolic, just like the blood, the cup in the Lord's Supper is symbolic of the blood. Let's keep reading here, though. Verse number, let's jump down to verse number 15. We're going to see now that was, that is the Passover. Those are the, the, the kind of the law that applies to the Passover. It takes place on the 14th day of the first month. And that is a high day. So if you're, if you, um, familiar with the Bible, you know, the Bible talks about the Sabbath days. Now we know that the Sabbath day literally just means the seventh day. So every seven days is a Sabbath. Now it doesn't, for our purposes, I'm going to be talking this morning about our current calendar because that's what we're familiar with. That's what we know. Try not to get too hung up on the actual days of the week. Yeah. So Jesus Christ is very clear. When they went to the tomb, it was early on the first day of the week. So whatever they called that day as the first day of the week doesn't matter. I'm going to call it Sunday because Sunday is our first day of the week. Okay? So just, just so we're clear on that, when I start using these days, don't be like, Wednesday, what do you mean Jesus died on Wednesday or Thursday? Or, you know, like, 
we're, we're just trying to keep it in the time frame and context that we are familiar with and that we understand. Okay. So the Sabbath is a seventh day. So when we talk about a regular Sabbath, it's our Saturday. That's the seventh day of the week for us. That is a Sabbath. Now, in addition to Saturday being the Sabbath, the Bible records high days and holy days also as being Sabbath days in the sense that they are Sabbath days because on the Sabbath day, there's supposed to be no work done. Nobody's supposed to be doing anything. You're, you, you're already supposed to have everything prepared and you do no work on the Sabbath day. And that's one of the Ten Commandments, so to honor the Sabbath day, right? We're supposed to, you know, God worked for six days and he rested on the seventh day. And that's where the Sabbath day was given. It's a rest day. But in addition to that Sabbath day, there's these other high holy days where it's also told you're not going to do work on this day. Okay, the Passover was a Sabbath day, that 14th day of the month. We also have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let's keep reading here in Exodus chapter 12. Look at verse 15. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread, even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For, what, for whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that, o that only may be done of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. So a full seven days they need to eat this unleavened bread. And then it says seven days there in verse 19. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether it be a stranger or born in the land. Now, one thing that you, you know, that you have to understand about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's actually a little bit confusing. You have to study it out pretty closely because it is referred to, it, it has multiple meanings when it's being referenced. The Feast of Unleavened Bread can be referring to the entire week, the seven days there that we saw that they're supposed to be eating unleavened bread. It could also be referring to a particular day. And you have to just check the context. So turn, if you would, to Leviticus 23. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show this to you. I'm going to prove this to you. We saw there in Exodus 12 that it's saying that, okay, we, got, we clearly got the seven-day time frame there. From the 14th day to the 21st day, very clear, right? You're supposed to be not eating you know, any leavened bread at all. That's, that was what they said in Exodus 12. Look at Leviticus chapter 23. Verse number four. The Bible reads, These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. It's consistent with what we've already seen. The fourteenth day, that's the Passover. Look at this. On, and on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. In the first day you shall have an holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seven days in holy convocation you shall do no servile work therein. So now he's saying that the 15th day of the month is the feast of unleavened bread. Now you still have that same week time frame, but he's be, the, the Bible is being very specific here of, of pointing out a day of the week. I mean, it's the 15th day. So you've got the 14th day and the 15th day. Refer to the 14th day as the Passover, 15th day, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then, of course, you still have the full seven days of not eating leavened bread. And um, so turn, if you would, to Matthew 26. I'm just going to read for you from Numbers 28. Numbers 28 basically says the same thing we just saw in Leviticus 23. Numbers 28, 16 says, In the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord, and in the 15th day of this month is the feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. The first day shall be in holy convocation. You should do no manner of work therein. So doing no manner of work is consistent with a Sabbath day, just like the regular Sabbath day. Now we're going to look at the timing of the Lord's Supper and the Passover that was being observed at that time. Matthew 26, 
Verse number four, right at the beginning of Matthew 26, is when the Pharisees and chief priests were conspiring on how they're going to kill Jesus. How are we going to get this guy? What are we going to do? We need to take him. We need to get rid of him. Verse number four says, And consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. So they're saying, We got to make sure that when we take him, it's not during this holy day. It's not done on a holiday because then the people are going to be really upset. You're arresting. So, you know, they don't want to have any problems with the multitudes, right? It's a holy day. You can't mess up the holy day. So we know from their planning that they're not planning on taking him on the actual holiday. Jump down to verse number 26. We're going to see here, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break and gave it to the disciples, said, Take, eat, eat, this is my body, and took the cup and gave thanks unto them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, I believe, because we saw earlier that Jesus was preparing the Passover. He said, I, I, have, I have really wanted to have this Passover meal with you before I suffer. Okay, what I believe is that Jesus here has prepared an early Passover meal to eat with his disciples and he's also instituting what we know as the Lord's Supper. Since Passover is such a critical event and he was about to fulfill the lamb sacrificed, he institutes the Lord's Supper as a way to continue to remember that he's the Passover lamb without actually you know, having to offer that sacrifice anymore. And, and he's showing, it's an important thing that he needs to show to his disciples. But since he is going to be crucified and sacrificed, he can't do that on the same day because he's, he's got other plans. He's got other places that he needs to be. He knows what's going to happen to him. Amen. He knows exactly what's going to happen. So, in preparation of that event, he says, we're going to have a Passover for ourselves. We're going to do this Passover, and I believe it's a day early. And as we get through this whole thing, you'll understand why I believe that a little bit more clearly. Say, well, wait a minute. I don't know if that makes sense. So that night, after he actually had, whatever day it is for right now, whatever day it is that Jesus has his supper with his disciples, Timeline events goes, he has the supper, he goes out into the Garden of Gethsemane afterwards, he's praying unto God, he gets arrested that night, he gets brought before you know, Pontius Pilate and Herod, and, and he's basically tried, he's convicted, he's sentenced, going, you know, going through that whole night into the next morning, and then that day, that next day is when he's, he carries his cross, he's crucified, you know, of course, he dies on the cross then right near evening time on that day. Okay. Turn, if you would, to John 19 because I want you to see this. And again, this is why I believe that he is eating his Passover meal a day in advance with his disciples because of what we see here in John 19. John 19 is when he was actually being crucified. Verse number 13. Look at verse number 13 of John 19. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement. But in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. Look at this. And it was the preparation of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. Jesus had held the Passover with his disciples the day before. Now we're seeing the next day is the preparation of the Passover. So the actual Passover hasn't happened yet. He had his supper with his disciples. But the supper itself, I mean, the, the, the Passover is still being prepared. Now, you say, well, what do you mean the preparation of the Passover? Why a preparation? Well, because when you are about to have a Sabbath day where you can't do any work, you have to prepare for that so that way when the day comes that you can't do anything, you don't have to do anything. All the preparation needed, everything, all the tools, all the work that needs to be done to prepare for a feast, to prepare for a meal, is all done in advance. The other thing that's important to note 
is that with the Hebrew calendar and the way that time was recognized, see, we, we are used to our days beginning at midnight, right? The new day starts 12, 12 a.m. is a new, you know, so from 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. is how we start each calendar day. That is not the way that the days started in Jesus' day and in these times, and especially the way that the Hebrews did it. So all, going all the way back to Genesis, in chapter 1, the Bible says, and the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning. So basically, their day ended when the sun goes down, which means the new day starts right after that. That is the beginning. You know, that's that's the, the, their midnight would be at that evening. Sun goes down. There you go. You're already starting the new day. Okay? And that's, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's still a 24-hour day. It's just, where's your frame of reference? But we need to understand that because <laughs> as we're going through, and I'm going to show you the, you know, the Jesus Christ, how long he's dead for, and again, why are we doing this on Wednesday? Okay? The Passover began at evening, which is literally like the start of their next day. So it, it, was the, it, it, it started everything off. This day that Jesus Christ is being offered up is their preparation day. So when Jesus died at even, essentially, I mean, it tells you the ninth hour of the day is when he gave up the ghost. Now, the ninth hour of the day, we use frames of reference, and, and, and I, I've done this before. We say, well, the ninth hour of the day, day starts at, you know, the sun comes up around 6 a.m., so the ninth hour of the day would be about 3 p.m. Well, that's assuming that the sun rose at 6 a.m. <laughs> if it's the ninth hour of the day, you know, the sunrise happens at different times. Same thing with the sunset, right? So your hour of the day that we have here isn't necessarily 3 p.m., right? So we've got to keep that in mind. It, it's, it's a good reference because in general, year-round, 6 a.m., good time for sunrise, 6 p.m., good time for, for a sunset, right? I mean, it's, it's a good average, it's a good generality, but it's not always the case. So when we're seeing what hour of the day it is, you just got to keep that in mind as well. So Jesus died at the ninth hour of the day, or, you know, it's, and it's very, very close to evening. It wasn't exactly evening because they still had to have that time to take his body down off the cross, prepare his body, bury it in a tomb. So there was that little bit of time left it, it, it works out so perfectly, though. You know, like, like God knows everything. The point isn't that, you know, in, in order for Jesus to fulfill his prophecy and to be the sacrifice life, he didn't have to literally physically die a few hours later, right? Oh, wasn't it even? No, so he's not the Passover lamb, right? Like, that's, that's ridiculous. He died at just the right time in order to provide for the rest of the things to play out, in order for them to bury his body, in order for everything to happen the way that it did, right? So even though it was a little bit earlier before evening, it was the same day as the preparation of the Passover. The Passover was starting at even that day. Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. Um, in John chapter 19, it's not just that one verse, it's, it's throughout this chapter. Verse number 31 tells us again, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day. Pay attention to that. It's not just a regular Sabbath. He's saying, this is a Sabbath. The next day is a Sabbath day, and that Sabbath day is a high day. It's a special day. It's a holy day. Why? Because it's the Passover. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Of course, they don't break Jesus' legs. He's already dead. Uh, not a bone of him was broken because he is the Passover lamb. And that was, that he, they pierced his, his side um, and blood and water gushed out. So, um, and they found out that he was already dead. And then at verse number 42, it says the same thing. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. So the tomb that they buried him in, when Joseph went to, to, to Pilate, he's like, hey, let me have the body. You know, and he's like, he's already dead. He was kind of surprised. And Joseph of Arimathea was like, yeah, you know, like I've got this place for him. And the, the place that they buried him was convenient because it was real close at hand because they're trying to get everything done. Why? Because the Sabbath was about to start. The Passover was about to start. So they bury him there. Now, here's what I believe. In, in our time reference, keeping all this stuff in consideration, Jesus Christ had his last supper on a Tuesday night with his disciples. 
Wednesday night, Jesus is crucified, and then the Passover begins at even. So our Wednesday night would be the beginning of Thursday at even, okay? Thursday then, so that's that going all through Thursday would be Passover. Thursday night starts the new day, which would be the 15th, and that would begin the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 15th day of the month. Well, guess what? That was also a Sabbath day. That was also a day of no work. So that would be the Friday. All, you know, Thursday night starts it all the way until Friday at even. Well, at Friday at even, that's when the Sabbath begins, which is the Saturday. Mm -hmm. And guess what? No work is being done on the Sabbath either. So you've got Jesus Christ being offered up as the, the Passover lamb on a day, on a year, when it just so happens that he's dead and buried for three days that no man is supposed to be doing any work whatsoever. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. While Jesus Christ paid and was buying our way into heaven, no man was supposed to be doing any works whatsoever on any of those days while he was dead. Amen. The Passover day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Sabbath day. All three days he was dead. And now you see, though, too, that you know, we have what's called Good Friday coming up next week on Friday. Yes. Supposedly, that's the day that Jesus Christ was crucified. That's not true. That's false. We know from, the, from Scripture that he was already risen the first day of the week very early. You cannot get three days and three nights in the grave when you go from Friday to Sunday. It's just not there. I mean, what do you got? If he died on a Friday, you got Friday night and you got Saturday night. He wasn't in the grave on Sunday night. That's two nights. Even if you want to count Friday and Sunday as days, you got three days and two nights at best. But that's not happening. There's no way. Because you don't even have Sunday as a day. The Bible says that when, uh, when Mary went to the tomb, it was as the day began to dawn. You didn't even have the day. Jesus was already gone. He wasn't even in the tomb anymore before sunrise. You don't have that day to work with at all. But if Jesus died on a Wednesday evening, right? You've got Thursday, you've got Friday, you've got Saturday. That's three days. You've got Wednesday night, uh, Thursday night, Friday night, all those three nights. At some, we don't know when Jesus actually rose from the dead. It was sometime after Saturday, you know, but he was gone before it was even dawn. So how much of that night did he spend? We don't know. doesn't matter. He fulfilled the three days and three nights by, by doing that. Um, and that's just to prove that, you know, Matthew 28, verse 1 says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And, of course, they show up. It's not there. As it began to dawn wasn't even dawn yet. Matthew 12.40 is, is where I referenced earlier. Matthew 12.40 is the reference. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Either Jesus lied or he wasn't crucified on a Friday. In our, you know, and, and, and risen again on a Sunday. Put it that way. You know, dead on Friday, risen again on Sunday. Can't get three days and three nights. Right. You just can't do it. So the reason why we are observing the Lord's Supper this Wednesday, one is because it's, you know, I, I don't think, and, and nowhere in Scripture are you going to see, it's not laid out the same. For, let me put that this. The Lord's Supper observance is not laid out the way that the Passover is laid out. Passover is... The 14th day of this month, every single year, the 15th day, Feast of Unleavened Bread, you know, God is very specific about those holidays. Very, very, very specific. The observance of the Lord's Supper, Jesus said things, this do ye, you know, as often as you do it in remembrance of me. You don't have the hard line 
ex, you know, exactness of it has to be. The, and, you know, I think we've gotten, we've got some grace to, to, to show the Lord's coming, to, to show his death and his, and his burial, his resurrection until he comes. I, I, and I do believe that. I'm not just like, you know, but, but I want to explain why we do things the way we do. With such a tie-in to the Passover, with, with, with Jesus Christ fulfilling that, with him having that supper and kind of transitioning from, hey, instead of now offering up a lamb and observing the Passover, now you're going to eat and remember my body and my blood. You're not going to commemorate a lamb. You're going to commemorate my, me, the lamb, right? My body, my blood being shed for you. So the same time when that would have happened, that, that same type of Passover event, is when we are commemorating that with the Lord's Supper. That is why we do that on the day that we do it. That was an event that happened once a year, the Passover lamb, which is why we, in turn, are now honoring that and recognizing that once a year on this date and, and recognizing as such. And since Easter is a day that we use to commemorate the resurrection of Christ, the previous Wednesday is when we're also trying to be as consistent as possible of, of you know, recognizing the Last Supper. So we could have done it on a Tuesday night, but we've got a Wednesday night service. It makes sense. It's, in my opinion, it's close enough. We don't know the exact days anyways. He's not saying, you know, we don't have our own calendar in the New Testament that God gave us that we have to follow everything that's, you know, according to the lunar calendar the way that they did. You know, th those things change. These feasts aren't, aren't recognized anymore. They've been fulfilled, right? So there's, not, uh, there's been a fulfillment of the law and, and as such. The, you know, the, the Passover lamb was part of the Mosaic law. But that has been fulfilled, which is why we don't do that part of the law anymore. It's fulfilled. It's done. Amen. So now if you, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. That is why, and I wanted to spend quite a bit of time just to make sure we're clear on why, why do we do it on this day as often as we do. This is the reasoning behind it. It's not just because, well, we just feel like doing it on this day. It's for, it's for very good reason. It's for a study in the scriptures. Now I'm going to go a little bit just into the actual practice of what's going to happen then on, on Wednesday when you come here and we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper and why we uh, do things the way that we do there. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I just want to point this out real quick because I mentioned it at the beginning of the sermon that, you know, I, don't, I have no problem with using the word communion. In fact, the name of my, the sermon this morning is called communion. That's it. 1 Corinthians 10, look at verse number 16. The Bible says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Jesus Christ, who is on his earth, said, I am the bread of life. Right? He referred to himself as being the bread. If you eat this bread, you know, you have eternal life. You drink this cup. The salvation is so easy, and he was making that clear. He, he said, you know, Moses gave you that manna from heaven. I'm the bread of life. You eat, you eat of this bread, you're never going to hunger anymore. You drink of this cup, you're never going to thirst anymore. He provided that salvation to us. So the communion of the blood of Christ is us partaking in and, and having Jesus Christ, flesh and blood, applied to us. Now, we don't go all, all you know, cannibalistic like the Catholic Church does and say we literally believe that we're eating the flesh of Jesus Christ in our mouths, that somehow it changes from a cracker to uh, actual human flesh, okay, that's just weird. And that is not, I mean, that's like the Pharisees that couldn't understand what Jesus was saying at all when he said, I'm the bread of life. It's obviously symbolic. Now, he, of course he shed his blood for us. Of course he, his body was broken for us, and it had to happen, but we're not literally eating his flesh. We're receiving what he did. And, and the, the eating of bread and, and the drinking of the cup is commemorating what he did for us. And that's it. But, but we are, in a sense, communing with him. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're showing that, that we have accepted him and that is applied. His blood is applied to us. His, his flesh being broken is applied to us. That's where the communion comes in. And that word is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
No problem with that at all. Now, I, I prefer to, you, to you refer to communion as the Lord's Supper just because I don't want there to be confusion for people who don't know. You know, and the Lord's Supper is also used, turn if you would to chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's the last place we're going to look at today. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, both terms are used. I mean, you got chapter 10 talk, talking about communion. Chapter 11 is going to talk about the Lord's Supper. So both very biblical terminologies to be used. Uh, look at verse number 17, because the first part of chapter 11 is kind of talking about the length of our hair and that type of stuff. Verse 17, we're going to pick up talking about the Lord's Supper. Verse 17, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. Now, I, I want to point this out just right off the bat, before I even get into the rest of these passages. 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, when you read these two books, it's obviously they're epistles of Paul. Paul's writing unto the church at Corinth. There are many epistles of Paul. Paul writes to the Romans, to the, to the church at Thessalonica, to the church at Ephesus, right? And they all have various things at their time that they needed to learn and understand, but also our scripture that we all learn from. That's God's word, right? But one of the things about the church at Corinth is they had a lot of problems, they were doing a lot of things wrong. And when you read these epistles, Paul is being very stern with them and saying, you know what, when I come, you know, I'm talking to you now. And people there were kind of mocking him and saying, oh yeah, you know, his words are great and mighty, but when he shows up, he's not going to be like that. You know, he's basically all talk. He's not, you know, he's nothing that we got to worry about. And he's telling them like, look, with the way that I write unto you is the way I'm going to be. Do you want me to come, you know, in love or do you want me to come with the rod? How, how do you want to do it? And this is the way that he dealt with the church at Corinth. So keep that in mind because what we're going to see here in 1 Corinthians 11 is that they were doing things all wrong. They needed to be corrected on some issues. So what he's doing is he's correcting them on what they were doing wrong in observance of the Lord's Supper and what they needed to be doing right. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe. He's saying, for, right off the bat, when you guys come together and you hold a church service, there are, I already hear, I'm hearing that there's divisions among you. You're not unified. You're not, you know, in one accord, in one place with a common faith between you. There, you got these different factions and divisions going on in church. So right off the bat, you've got a big problem. He said, I partly believe it. Verse number 19, for there must also be there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. The purpose of coming to church is not to eat the Lord's Supper. That's what he's saying. What they had done was they made this into this big feast thing where it's probably happening all the time and that that came to be the point as to why they were gathering together. When you come together in one place, it's not just to eat the Lord. I mean, that's not why you're gathering together. That's not the point of church. And look at what he says, because he, he's, he's commenting and condemning them on this. Verse 21, for, he's going to explain what he just said. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. One is hungry, another is drunken. You got all kinds of stuff going on. People are getting real hungry. They're saying, oh, you know what? I'm not going to wait for anyone else. I'm just going to go to the front of the line. I'm going to get my food. I'm going to eat, you know. And it was pretty chaotic and not the, the right spirit for sure in this church. And he's saying, look, verse 22, what, have you not houses to eat and to drink in? You don't need to come to church to eat your meals. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a potluck. There's nothing wrong with having, we have food at church this morning. We've got some food on the table over there. But what's not happening here is people aren't saying, oh, it's church and I need to eat. So I'm going to go to church because I need to eat lunch. Because I need to eat dinner. Because this is, you know, that we're just going to, to the assembly, to the congregation, so that I can eat my food. And that's the reason why you come to church. Because I know if I go to church, there's going to be food, and that's why I'm going there. That's what they were doing here. Some people are coming hung hungry. You know, some people are coming drunken. And he's saying, look, don't you just have home? Like, eat at home. Eat and drink at your home. And then come. He says, what have you not houses, in verse 22, to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. 
For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now he's explaining what happened. This is the Lord's Supper. This is what he did. This is what happened. It's not what you guys are doing. It's not this big feast. It's not all this stuff where you're just coming to church hungry and you're expecting to get fed. No, this is what he did. He took some bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and said, this is my blood, which is said, you know, this cup, uh, verse 25, this cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink in remembrance of me. He's explaining, this is what he did. This is what the Lord's Supper is about. It's not to come and eat this big feast. And, you know, people, some people are hungry and, you know, no, that is not what it's about at all. Verse 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Verse 27, Wherefore, so because of this, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworth unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now I'm going to pause here just for a second and just explain this. People practice the, the Lord's Supper differently. There's, there's uh, open, closed, and closed, or closed and close, right? I know these are the different terminology. Um, what we practice here and what I, what I believe the Bible's teaching right here is that it's up to you to determine. You discern the Lord's body. When you're unworthy, I mean, think about this. We're all unworthy of salvation, but the way that you could be worthy of communing with the Lord is if you've accepted the Lord as your Savior. You are a saved person. You're believed. You know, he provides the worth to you. you, you know, we're all unworthy, but if you're not saved, you're not discerning what you're actually doing there. You're not discerning the Lord's body. That's when you don't want to be partaking in as if you are saved, taking the bread and, and drinking the cup and showing the Lord's death as if, that's what you're relying in when you're not. See, we take the communion because we're trusting, we're relying on the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. We're relying on what he did for us. We believe that he died once to pay the sins of all, you know, for all time. That's what we're trusting in. That's what we're relying in. So when you take the bread and drink the cup, you're showing the Lord's death till he come. That's not unworthily. When you're, you're, you're saved because you've already put your trust in him. But when you're not saved, he's saying, you know, that's not a good thing. You don't even understand what you're doing. And it's actually a serious thing to partake in because you know, observing the Lord's Supper is a serious event. And he shows us here exactly how serious it is. Um, verse number 30 says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you. For this cause, for the cause of people eating and drinking unworthily, there's people that are weak, there's people that are sickly, and many sleep. And when he's talking about sleep, he's talking about dying. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. Now look at, remember when he said in verse 18, first of all, when you come together in the church, oh wait, no, not there. Um, verse number 20, excuse me. Verse number 20. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And then he continued on about all the things that they were doing wrong. In verse 33, then he says, Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat. So he's not saying you don't come together to eat the Lord. So he's, he's saying that the way that they're doing it, he explained all the reasons why they were doing it wrong. Now he's saying, okay, I've explained all this to you. This is what Jesus did with his disciples. Now, when you come together to eat, tarry for another. What does that mean? You wait for other people. You show respect. You're restrained. You're not super hungry and just, man, I just need to get that food cut into the front of the line because you're so hungry. You've already eaten. You're already satisfied physically. You're not acting on, your, on the, the lust of your flesh to eat food. You're commemorating what Jesus did for you. And you could just, that's fine. You, I'll wait for you. You, takes for, you, know, you go first. Everyone waits for each other. And everything could be done decently and in order. 
as there's this somber event going on where we're thinking about and meditating on what Christ did for us, it's a very serious event. It's a very important event. We're, we're, we're not just, it's not just some, you know, some kegger, some party. It's, you know, disrespectful in any way to what Jesus did for us. We're showing respect. We're showing honor by keeping everything decent, keeping everything in order. We're not just coming to pig out and have some meal. We're, we're saying, this bread, this represents the, the, the flesh of Jesus Christ. This, this cup this, this wine represents his blood that was shed for us. You know, let's let that sink in. And, and that's what we're, we're going to be doing on Wednesday night. And this is the Apostle Paul telling the church at Corinth, this is what you do. This is the way it's done. It's not the way that you're doing it. You do it this way. Verse number 34, he says, And if any man hunger, let him eat at home. So on Wednesday night, don't come here thinking that like, Oh, man, Free food at church. I'm going to get my dinner. We're going to have those, that communion. No. That's, <laughs> you hunger, let them eat at home. That you come not together in a condemnation and the rest will I set in order when I come. Now, a few last points. The main point, and I, and I already went over that, about eating and drinking unworthily. I do think that's talking about not being saved. But I also believe that there is a worthily, when it comes to just your spiritual walk with God, and, and I think that we ought to Pay attention to that individually. You know, judge within yourselves. Have you just been totally disrespecting God and not listening to Him and not, want, you know, not wanting to hear from Him at all and, and just living the life however you want to do it? You might want to be careful when you come in and show the, 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 the body and blood of Christ when you're completely living opposite of, what, of the way that He was doing it. And the reason why I say that is because there were people in the church that were getting weak and sickly, and I don't think that was all just from unsaved people eating. I, I think there are there some saved people that, that are just not showing the proper respect and that God was kind of judging them for, for not, um, not honoring this the way that they ought to. And that's my personal opinion on this. That's the way I see it. I'm not dogmatic about that, but I know for a fact that, you know, if you're not saved, you're definitely eating and drinking unworthily. But take that into consideration. That's why I'm also preaching this now instead of on Wednesday so that you could at least try to prepare your heart, be ready for it, be like, you know, we're going to be doing this on Wednesday. Think about that. Make sure you're, you're, you're kind of get, getting yourself in the right place. Also, when we take the bread and eat and drink of the cup, when Jesus said, he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, what he did, he took the bread and he broke it. And it was unleavened bread, by the way, because they were celebrating the Passover. Now, the reason why that's important, and that's what we eat here, is unleavened bread. And we don't get the pre-cut squares or whatever for everyone to eat individually because the whole point is he's breaking it. We're going to eat broken pieces of bread symbolizing Jesus' broken body. And look, you might say, oh, well, who cares? Oh, I think God cares. You know, I mean, if, if we're, we're supposed to be you know, being representative of something, let's follow it as closely as we can. All the details that we have, let's follow it. If Jesus broke the bread, we're going to break the bread. We're going to symbolize his broken body. We're going to do it with the unleavened bread. Leaven all throughout the Bible is representative of sin. Again, another reason why the unleavened bread is important when we're talking about it, that is what is being related as Jesus' body. Jesus was without sin. So we're going to use the unleavened bread to represent his body, to represent the sinless Jesus Christ, which is also why the wine that we drink is not fermented. It's non-alcoholic. And, and you know what? You want to know more about that subject? I preach entire sermons about this, proving from Scripture that wine in the Bible does not only, it refers to Alcoholic wine as well as non-alcoholic wine. The term wine was used to refer to two different types of beverages. And that is proven. I can prove that to you. I can prove that to you after service. But if you want to hear the whole, whole sermon, I've preached entire sermons on that. There are, there are places in the scripture where the Bible says that, that wine is a blessing. It's a great thing. And there's places in the Bible, like in Proverbs 23, it says, Look not thou upon the wine when it's red, when it gave it this color of the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. It's calling it the poison of, of dragons and venom of asps. 
Okay, talking about the beverage. They're not the same thing. The alcoholic wine, you stay away from that. And it, it goes hand in hand with the, with the leaven. The leaven of the bread, if leaven represents sin, well, in order to get alcoholic wine, as opposed to the pure blood of the grape, like the Bible talks about, the pure blood of the grape, when you freshly squeeze a grape, you get juice out of that. That's not alcoholic. There's a fermentation process involved with yeast or leaven. The same way that you leaven bread, there's a, that's a yeast. The same way you get alcoholic wine is with a yeast. We use unleavened bread. We use unleavened, if you will, wine. Amen. It's the pure blood of Jesus Christ that we're representing. So when you come here, don't worry. You don't have to worry about... Uh, Getting, getting a bunch of booze or, or anything like that when we commemorate the, uh, the Lord's Supper because we're going to be doing it to the best, the, the way that we see fit. The way I see it from the Bible. So um, I, hope, I hope that helps explain. I hope I did, I did a good job for uh, clarifying why we do the way we do it, what we're going to be commemorating, the way that the Lord's Supper is going to be operated here at Word of Truth Baptist Church. And you know what? You're saved, born again. Come with us and, and join us for the, on Wednesday night. And we'll, we'll, and we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper and we'll honor what he did for us. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for that great gift that you gave us. Lord, we are humble. Uh, we, we are so thankful for you doing that, for you taking on such a burden for us, for, for us sinners, dear Lord, that you um, faced such a horrible death, that you shed your blood for us, that you were mocked and ridiculed and nailed to that cross, dear Lord, and spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. All for us. What amazing love that is, dear Lord, and, and it's, it's love that's beyond understanding for us. And we just, we're just so thankful that you did that. God, I pray that you would please help us all this week to, to really be mindful. Let, let us never forget that. That's why we, it's so important for us to at least do this once a year that we could commemorate and remember the sacrifice that you made for us, dear God. Help us this afternoon to go out and share that love and to share what, that sacrifice that you made with other people that don't know the gospel, that don't know the salvation, dear Lord. Help us to reach people, lead us and guide us that we can show others how to be saved, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.